the history of the Blackfoot tribe. The Blackfoot tribe are the most mysterious, yet most compassionate tribe in the northwest region of the United States. Their history is complex and rich, beautiful and vibrant. This is their story. The Blackfoot Indians, reside in the Great Plains of Montana and the Canadian provinces of Alberta and Saskatchewan. The name is said to have come from the color of the people's moccasins, made of leather. They had typically dyed or painted the soles of their moccasins black. One legendary story claimed that the Siksika walked through ashes of prairie fires, which in turn colored the bottoms of their moccasins black. The Blackfeet people have occupied the Rocky Mountain region for more than 10,000 years. In the 18th and 19th centuries, the four Blackfeet bands the North Pagan, the South Pagan, the Blood, and the Siksika occupied much of the northern plains and were nomadic, following the seasonal grazing and migration of buffalo. Members of the Blackfeet nation in the United States primarily descend from the South Pagan. To this day, they use the land for cultural and spiritual purposes. Due to language and cultural patterns, anthropologists believe the Blackfoot tribe did not originate in the Great Plains of the Midwest North America, but migrated from the upper northeastern part of the country. They coalesced as a group while living in the forests of what is now the northeastern United States. They were mostly located around the modern-day border between Canada and the state of Maine. By the 13th century AD, the Blackfoot were moving in search of more land. They moved west and settled for a while north of the Great Lakes in present-day Canada, but had to compete for resources with existing tribes like the Sioux and the Lakota. They left the Great Lakes area and kept moving west, near the tribes of the Cheyenne peoples and the Cherokee. When they moved, they usually packed their belongings on an A-shaped sled called a travois. The travois was designed for transport over dry land. The Blackfoot had relied on dogs to pull the travois, they did not acquire horses until the 18th century. From the Great Lakes area, they continued to move west and eventually settled in the Great Plains. The plains had covered approximately 780,000 square miles with the Saskatchewan River to the north, the Rio Grande to the south, the Mississippi River to the east, and the Rocky Mountains to the west. Adopting the use of the horse, the Blackfoot established themselves as one of the most powerful Indian tribes on the plains in the late 18th century, earning themselves the name the Lords of the Plains. Stories of their adventures trace their residence and possession of their plains territory to time immemorial. The Blackfoot's main source of food on the plains was the American bison, or commonly known as the buffalo. It is the largest mammal in North America, standing about 6 feet 6 inches tall and weighing up to 2,000 pounds before the introduction of horses, the Blackfoot needed other ways to get in range. The buffalo jump was one of the most common ways. The hunters would round up the buffalo into V-shaped pens, and drive them over a cliff, they hunted pronghorn antelopes in the same way. Afterwards the hunters would go to the bottom and take as much meat as they could carry back to camp. They also used camouflage for hunting. The hunters would take buffalo skins from previous hunting trips and drape them over their bodies to blend in and mask their scent. By subtle moves, the hunters could get close to the herd. When close enough, the hunters would attack with arrows or spears to kill wounded animals. The people used virtually all parts of the body and skin. The women prepared the meat for food, by boiling, roasting or drying for jerky. This process did to last a long time without spoiling, and they depended on bison meat to get through the winters. The winters were long, harsh, and cold due to the lack of trees in the plains, so people stockpiled meat in summer. As a ritual, hunters often ate the bison heart minutes after the kill, delicious. The women tanned and prepared the skins to cover the teepees. These were made of log poles, with the skins draped over it. The teepee remained warm in the winter and cool in the summer, and was a great shield against the wind. The women also made clothing from the skins, such as robes and moccasins, and made soap from the fat. Both men and women made utensils, sewing needles and tools from the bones, using tendon for fastening and binding. The stomach and bladder were cleaned and prepared for use for storing liquids. Dried bison dung was fuel for the fires. This method was similar to the methods used by the Scandinavian Vikings, and may have been adopted by the Native American tribes during first contact between the Vikings and the Native American peoples in the late 10th century AD, or vice versa. The Blackfoot considered the animal sacred and integral to their lives. Discovery and uses of horses up until around 1730 AD, the Blackfoot traveled by foot and used dogs to carry and pull some of their goods. They had not seen horses in their previous lands, but were introduced to them on the plains, as other tribes, such as the Shazone, had already adopted their use. 
They saw the advantages of horses and wanted some. The Blackfoot called the horses Ponekamata, aka Elk Dogs. The horses could carry much more weight than dogs and moved at a greater speed. They could be ridden for hunting and travel. Horses revolutionized life on the Great Plains and soon came to be regarded as a measure of wealth. Warriors regularly raided other tribes for their best horses. Horses were generally used as universal standards of barter. Medicine men were paid for cures and healing with horses. Those who designed shields or war bonnets were also paid in horses. The men gave horses to those who were owed gifts as well as to the needy. An individual's wealth rose with the number of horses accumulated, but a man did not keep an abundance of them. The individual's prestige and status was judged by the number of horses that he could give away. For the Indians who lived on the plains, the principal value of property was to share it with others. After having driven the hostile Shazon and Arapaho from the northwestern plains, the Blackfoot began in 1800 AD in a long phase of keen competition in the fur trade with their former Cree allies, which often escalated militarily. In addition, both groups had adapted to using horses about 1730, so by mid-century an adequate supply of horses became a question of survival. Horse theft was at this stage not only a proof of courage, but often a desperate contribution to survival, for many ethnic groups competed for hunting in the grasslands. The Cree and Assiniboine continued horse raiding against the Gros Venter, allies of the Blackfoot tribes. The Gros Venters were also known as Miawati Anu, Nawatami. They live in Hose people, because their tribal lands were along the Saskatchewan River Forks, the confluence of North and South Saskatchewan River. They had to withstand attacks of enemies with guns. In retaliation for Hudson's Bay Company or HBC, supplying their enemies with weapons, the Gros Venter attacked and burned in 1793 South Branch House of the HBC on the South Saskatchewan River near the present village of St. Louis, Saskatchewan. Then, the tribe moved southward to the Milk River in Montana and allied themselves with the Blackfoot. The area between the North Saskatchewan River and Battle River, the name derives from the war forts between these two tribal groups, was the limit of the now warring tribal alliances. Blackfoot war parties would ride hundreds of miles on raids. A boy on his first war party was given a silly or derogatory name. But after he had stolen his first horse or killed an enemy, he was given a name to honor him. Warriors would strive to perform various acts of bravery called counting coup, in order to move up in social rank. The coups in order of importance were, taking a gun from a living enemy and or touching him directly, capturing lances, and bows, scalping an enemy, killing an enemy, freeing a tied horse from in front of an enemy lodge, leading a war party, scouting for a war party, stealing headdresses, shields, pipes, sacred ceremonial pipes, and driving a herd of stolen horses back to camp. The Blackfoot Nation were enemies of the Gro, Cheyenne, and Sioux on the Great Plains, and the Shazone, Flathead, Kalispel, Kootenai, and Nez Perce in the mountain country to their west and southwest. Their most mighty and most dangerous enemy, however, were the political-slash-military-slash-trading alliance of the Iron Confederacy. With the expansion of the Nihiopwa to the north, west and southwest, they integrated larger groups of Iroquois, Chipian, Danzak Tunexa, Flathead, and later Gros Venter, in their local groups. Loosely allied with the Nihiopwa, but politically independent, were neighboring tribes like the Ktunexa, Sequepemk and in particular the archenemy of the Blackfoot, the Gro, or Indian trading partners like the Nez Perce and Flathead. The Shazone got horses much sooner than the Blackfoot and soon occupied much of present-day Alberta, most of Montana, and parts of Wyoming, and raided the Blackfoot frequently. Once the Pgun gained access to horses of their own and guns, obtained from the HPC via the Cree and the Sinniboyin, the situation changed. By 1787 AD, David Thompson reports that the Blackfoot had completely conquered most of Shazone territory, and frequently captured Shazone women and children and forcibly assimilated them into Blackfoot society, further increasing their advantages over the Shazone. Thompson reports that Blackfoot territory in 1787 was from the North Saskatchewan River in the north to the Missouri River in the south, and from Rocky Mountains in the west out to a distance of 300 miles to the east. Between 1790 and 1850 AD, the Nihopwat were at the height of their power, they could successfully defend their territories against the Sioux and the Blackfoot Confederacy. During the so-called Buffalo Wars from 1850 to 1870, 
they penetrated further and further into the territory from the Blackfoot Confederacy in search for the buffalo, so that the Pekin were forced to give way in the region of the Missouri River. The Kenai withdrew to the Bow River and Belly River. Only the Siksika could hold their tribal lands along the Red Deer River. Around 1870, the alliance between the Blackfoot and the Gros Venter broke, and the latter began to look to their former enemies, the Southern Assiniboine, for protection. Anthony Hende of the Hudson's Bay Company met a large Blackfoot group in 1754 in what is now Alberta. The Blackfoot had established dealings with traders connected to the Canadian and English fur trade before meeting the Lewis and Clark expedition in 1806. Lewis and Clark and their men had embarked on mapping the Louisiana Territory and the Missouri River for the United States government. On their return trip from the Pacific coast, Lewis and three of his men encountered a group of young Blackfoot warriors with a large herd of horses, and it was clear to Mary with the Lewis that they were not far from much larger groups of warriors. Lewis explained to them that the United States government wanted peace with all Indian nations, and that the U.S. leaders had successfully formed alliances with other Indian nations. The group camped together that night, and at dawn there was a scuffle as it was discovered that the Blackfoot were trying to steal guns and run off with their horses while the Americans slept. In the ensuing struggle, one warrior was fatally stabbed and another shot by Lewis and presumed killed. This had begun the resentment between the U.S. government and the Blackfoot nation. In subsequent years, American mountain men trapping in Blackfoot country generally encountered hostility. When John Coulter, a member of the Lewis and Clark expedition, returned to Blackfoot country soon after, made camp and attempted to hunt. After hunting parties discovered his camp, he barely escaped with his life. In 1809, Coulter and his companion were trapping on the Jefferson River by canoe when they were surrounded by hundreds of Blackfoot warriors on horseback on both sides of the riverbank. Coulter's companion, John Potts, did not surrender and was killed. Coulter was stripped of his clothes and forced to run for his life, after being given a head start which eventually became famously known in the annals of the West as Coulter's Run. He eventually escaped by reaching a river five miles away and diving under either an island of driftwood or a beaver dam, where he remained concealed until after nightfall. He trekked another 300 miles to a fort. In the context of shifting tribal politics due to the spread of horses and guns, the Blackfoot initially tried to increase their trade with the HBC traders in Rupert's land whilst blocking access to the HBC by neighboring peoples to the west. But the HBC trade eventually reached into what is now inland British Columbia. By the late 1820s, this prompted, the Blackfoot, and in particular the Picani, whose territory was rich in beaver, temporarily put aside cultural prohibitions and environmental constraints to trap enormous numbers of these animals and, in turn, receive greater quantities of trade items. The HBC encouraged the Blackfoot to trade by setting up posts on the North Saskatchewan River, on the northern boundary of their territory. In the 1830s the Rocky Mountain region and the wider Saskatchewan district were the HBC's most profitable, and Rocky Mountain House was the HBC's busiest post. It was primarily used by the Picani. Other Blackfoot nations traded more in pemmican and buffalo skins than beaver, and visited other posts such as Fort Edmonton. Meanwhile, in 1822 the American Fur Company entered the Upper Missouri region from the south for the first time, without Blackfoot permission. This led to tensions in the conflict until 1830, when peaceful trade was established. This was followed by the opening of Fort Pekin as the first American trading post in Blackfoot territory in 1831, joined by Fort Mackenzie in 1833. The Americans offered better terms of trade and were more interested in buffalo skins than the HBC, which brought them more trade from the Nyat Zaitapi. The HBC responded by building Bow Fort, Pagan Post, on the Bow River in 1832, but it was not a success. In 1833, German explorer Prince Maximilian of Wied Neuwied and Swiss painter Karl Bodmer spent months with the Blackfoot to get a sense of their culture. Bodmer portrayed their society in paintings and drawings. Contact with the Europeans caused a spread of infectious diseases to the Blackfoot, mostly cholera and smallpox. In one instance in 1837, an American fur company steamboat, the St. Peter's, was headed to Fort Union and several passengers contracted smallpox on the way. They continued to send a smaller vessel with supplies farther up the river to posts among the Blackfoot. The Blackfoot contracted the disease and eventually 6,000 died, marking an end to their dominance among tribes over the plains. 
the Hudson's Bay Company did not require or help their employees get vaccinated. The English doctor Edward Jenner had developed a technique 41 years before but its use was not yet like many other Great Plains Indian nations. The Blackfoot often had hostile relationships with white settlers. Despite the hostilities, the Blackfoot stayed largely out of the Great Plains Indian Wars, neither fighting against or scouting for the United States Army. One of their friendly bands, however, was attacked by mistake and nearly destroyed by the U.S. Army in the Maria's Massacre on January 23, 1870, undertaken as an action to suppress violence against settlers. A friendly relationship with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and learning of the brutality of the Maria's Massacre discouraged the Blackfoot from engaging in wars against Canada and the United States. When the Lakota, together with the Cheyenne and Arapaho allies, were fighting the United States Army, they sent runners into Blackfoot territory, urging them to join the fight. Crowfoot, one of the most influential Blackfoot chiefs, dismissed the Lakota messengers. He threatened to ally with the NWMP to fight them if they came north into Blackfoot country again. News of Crowfoot's loyalty reached Ottawa and from the London, Queen Victoria praised Crowfoot and the Blackfoot for their loyalty. Despite his threats, Crowfoot later met those Lakota who had fled with Sitting Bull into Canada after defeating George Armstrong Custer and his battalion at the Battle of Little Big Horn. Crowfoot considered the Lakota then to be refugees and was sympathetic to their strife, but retained his anti-war stance. Sitting Bull and Crowfoot fostered peace between the two nations by a ceremonial offering of tobacco, ending hostilities between them. Sitting Bull was so impressed by Crowfoot that he named one of his sons after him. The Blackfoot also chose to stay out of the Northwest Rebellion, led by the famous Matiz leader Louis Roll. Louis Roll and his men added to the already unsettled conditions facing the Blackfoot by camping near them. They tried to spread discontent with the government and gain a powerful ally. The Northwest Rebellion was made up mostly of Matiz, Assiniboine and Plains Gris, who all fought against European encroachment and destruction of bison herds. The Plains Cree were one of the Blackfoot's most hated enemies. However, the two nations made peace when Crowfoot adopted Poundmaker, an influential Cree chief and great peacemaker, as his son. Although he refused to fight, Crowfoot had sympathy for those with the rebellion, especially the Cree led by such notable chiefs as Poundmaker, Big Bear, Wandering Spirit and Fine Day. When news of continued Blackfoot neutrality reached Ottawa, Lord Lansdowne, the Governor-General, expressed his thanks to Crowfoot again on behalf of the Queen back in London. The cabinet of Sir John A. Macdonald, the current Prime Minister of Canada at the time, gave Crowfoot a round of applause. From 1840 to 1910, the Blackfoot faced a series of calamities and hardships. It was a sad time in Blackfoot history, they faced a dwindling food supply, as European-American hunters were hired by the U.S. government to kill bison so the Blackfeet would remain in their reservation. Settlers were also encroaching on their territory. Without the buffalo, the Blackfoot were forced to depend on the United States government for food supplies. In 1855, the Blackfoot chief Lane Bull reluctantly made a peace treaty with the United States government. The Lane Bull Treaty promised the Blackfoot $20,000 annually in goods and services in exchange for their moving onto a reservation. In 1860, very few buffalo were left, and the Blackfoot became completely dependent on government supplies. Often the food was spoiled by the time they received it, or supplies failed to arrive at all. Hungry and desperate, Blackfoot raided white settlements for food and supplies, and outlaws on both sides stirred up trouble. Events were catalyzed by Owl Child, a young Pugan warrior who stole a herd of horses in 1867 from an American trader named Malcolm Clark. Clark retaliated by chucking Owl Child down and severely beating him in full view of Owl Child's camp, and humiliating him. Clark then also raped Owl Child's wife. The raped woman gave birth to a child as a result of the rape. Two years after the beating, in 1869 Owl Child and some associates killed Clark at his ranch after dinner, and severely wounded his son Horace. Public outcry from news of the event led to General Philip Sheridan to dispatch a band of cavalry, led by Major Eugene Baker, to find Owl Child and his camp and punish them. On January 23, 1870, a camp of Pagan Indians was spotted by army scouts and reported to the dispatched cavalry, but it was mistakenly identified as a hostile band. Around 200 soldiers surrounded the camp the following morning and prepared for an ambush. Before the command to fire, the chief heavy runner was alerted to soldiers on the snowy bluffs above the encampment. He walked toward them, carrying his safe conduct paper. 
heavy runner and his band of pagans shared peace between American settlers and troops at the time of the event. Heavy runner was shot and killed by Army Scout Joe Cobell, whose wife was part of the camp of the hostile mountain chief, further along the river, from whom he wanted to divert attention. Fellow Scout Joe Kip had realized the error and tried to signal the troops. He was threatened by the cavalry for reporting that the people they attacked were friendly. Following the death of Heavy Runner, the soldiers attacked the camp. According to their count, they killed 173 Pukin and suffered just one U.S. Army soldier casualty, who fell off his horse and broke his leg, dying of complications. Most of the victims were women, children and the elderly, as most of the younger men were out hunting. The army took 140 Pukin prisoner and then released them. With their camp and belongings destroyed, they suffered terribly from exposure, making their way as refugees to Fort Benton. As reports of the massacre gradually were learned in the East, members of the United States Congress and press were outraged. General William Sherman reported that most of the killed were warriors under Mountain Chief. An official investigation never occurred, and no official monument marks the spot of the massacre. Compared to events such as the massacres at Wounded Knee and Sand Creek, the Maria's massacre remains largely unknown. But, it confirmed President Ulysses S. Grant in his decision not to allow the army to take over the Bureau of Indian Affairs, as it had been suggesting to combat corruption among Indian agents. Grant chose to appoint numerous Quakers to those positions as he pursued a peace policy with Native Americans. The Cree and Assiniboine also suffered from the dwindling herds of the buffalo. By 1850 herds were found almost exclusively on the territory of the Blackfoot. Therefore, in 1870 various Nihiopwat bands began a final effort to get hold of their prey, by beginning a war. They hoped to defeat the Blackfoot weakened by smallpox and attacked a camp near Fort Whoopup. But they were defeated in the so-called Battle of the Belly River, near Lethbridge, called the Sini Tomoki, where we slaughtered the Gree, and lost over 300 warriors. The next winter the hunger compelled them to negotiate with the Blackfoot, with whom they made a final lasting peace. The United States passed laws that adversely affected the Blackfoot. In 1874, the US Congress voted to change the Blackfoot reservation borders without discussing it with them. They received no other land or compensation for the land lost, and in response, the Kenai, Siksika, and Puka moved to Canada, only the Pecuni remained in Montana. The winter of 1883 to 1884 became known as Starvation's Winter because no government supplies came in, and the buffalo were gone. That winter, 600 Blackfoot died of hunger. In efforts to assimilate the Native Americans to European American ways, in 1898, the government dismantled tribal governments and outlawed the practice of traditional Indian religions. They required Blackfoot children to go to boarding schools, where they were forbidden to speak their native language practice customs, or wear traditional clothing. In 1907, the United States government adopted a policy of allotment of reservation land to individual heads of families to encourage family farming and break up the communal tribal lands. Each household received a 160-acre farm, and the government declared the remainder surplus to the tribe's needs. It put it up for sale for development. The allotments were too small to support farming on the arid plains. A 1919 drought destroyed crops and increased the cost of beef. Many Indians were forced to sell their allotted land and pay taxes which the government said they owed. In 1934 the Indian Reorganization Act, passed by the Franklin D. Roosevelt administration, ended allotments and allowed the tribes to choose their own government. They were also allowed to practice their cultures. In 1935, the Blackfeet Nation of Montana began a tribal business council. After that, they wrote and passed their own constitution, with an elected representative government. Blackfeet Nation today works hard to retain its culture in the modern era. Annual celebrations of Blackfeet culture include the North American Days Celebration and the Heart Butte Days, featuring traditional dancing, singing, drumming, stick games, and rodeos. Today the owner of this YouTube page, Ian Tusk, can trace back his lineage to the Blackfoot Nation with his great-grandfather, Carlos Franklin Finefrock. A.K.A. Fine Rock. Stay tuned for more history documentaries and don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel Iron Tusk 341.